Now, next up here on the stage in the Agriland Pavilion at the National Ploughing Championships in Rathaniska on our live stream, brought to you in association with UPMC, we're going to focus on organic farming. Now, we were speaking with Minister of State at the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, Pippa Hackett, a little while ago about what she is hoping to achieve in organics. But let's talk to three people who are, I suppose, involved in it day to day and in and out. No more than the minister is, I suppose, as well. Jack Nolan is a senior inspector and head of the organics division with the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Beside him is Grace Maher. Grace is the development officer with the Irish Organic Association. And on the stool is Kevin O'Hanlon. And Kevin is an organic farmer based in Carlow and Wexford. We'll hear a little bit more about two enterprises there, uh, but all organic as well. Kevin and your journey uh, on conversion as well with that but Jack can I start with yourself because under the climate action plan a target of 450,000 hectares by 2030 which will bring us up to 10 percent of agricultural land being for farmed organically now the minister told me just a little while ago she's quite confident she said the current figures with the, the latest additions to the farming uh, organic farming scheme will bring it up to somewhere around four percent is it a big ask or do you think we're on the right path? I, I think we'll exceed it. We're at 180,000 hectares at the minute. A couple of years ago we were at 74,000. There's never been such support available for organic farmers. And I don't just mean money. Like if you look at the number of Chagask advisors, the number of private advisors, uh, people like Grace, the Organic Trust, the Irish Organic Association, there's much more understanding of organics and awareness of it. And Board B are going to launch a marketing campaign later on in the year to show people what is, what is organic all about, to show consumers, because we need people in the marketplace to start spending their money. Like if you look at the Citizens' Assembly on Biodiversity, they said that we want more organic farmers in Ireland. Well, now is the opportunity for them to go out and buy our Irish organic produce. So I think it's very achievable. Yeah. And do you think that there is a perception sometimes organic, it's more expensive, it's a bit of a luxury? Is that something we need to tackle as well with consumers? Well, I suppose, first off, we waste about a third of the food we produce between the field and the fork. So, like, 10% of greenhouse gases in the world come from wasted food. Like, if we sorted out what we're eating, there'd be no issue with organics. And to a farmer, for any farmer listening in, farmers get about 10% of a premium, say, for beef or sheep or a little bit with it. Like when someone goes into the shop, if they could buy directly from the farmer and cut out the retailer altogether, like the shops need to look at how much of a markup they're taking on organics, I think, because it is something that people want. Like we have an organic village down on row 16, if anyone would like to come down to it. We had one for the first year last year. It's double the size this year. And there's a tremendous flow of people coming in to find out about organics. But I think there's a huge appetite out there for it yeah. among consumers. But I suppose that's reflected in the over 2,000 farmers who, who joined the organic farming scheme when it was opened most recently. Farmers are very, very interested, and a lot of farmers out there probably don't have a whole pile to do to, to convert as well. There's a huge amount of farmers that need more knowledge about organics. I'd say that's the biggest thing, that they didn't understand it and they weren't being supported as they switched over to organic farming. I think that support is available now, and what you'd say to people is, look, come and get information and then make up your mind. Don't be listening to someone up the road that's saying, oh, if you go organic, you have to do this, you have to do that. What we're finding now is that people are coming to, there's about 50 organic farm walks this year. Come and talk to a farmer, talk to someone like Kevin, who's a practitioner. Ask him how does he deal with the housing, what's the situation as regards dosing cattle or sheep and so on. And make a decision for yourself, because for an awful lot of farmers, they're much better off if they come to organics, but they'll also be under a lot of pressure, under a lot less pressure, because farmers are one of the most stressed out occupations that we have. They suffer from very poor mental and physical health, and they're not getting proper financial rewards for it. So you need to change something. Like, we just had a very bad harvest. For people looking into next year, beef prices are coming up a little bit. We've had a bad year for sheep. What are you going to do different next year? Are you going to hope that the market's going to pay you better? Or are you going to take action? And going organic is taking action and taking control of your farm away from a retailer, away from a salesperson that's selling you expensive inputs and you're not getting paid for your product at the end of the day. And Grace, is that where we're trying to move organics from being less of a niche kind of an enterprise into to more mainstream and, and something that's more accepted and, and, and not, you know, people maybe having kind of false preconceptions about the, the, the whole thing? 
Absolutely, Ashling. I mean, yes, in Ireland it probably would have been perceived as niche, particularly when we were had 1%, 2% of farmers organic. But now we're on the right trajectory, we're 4%. And really we need to mirror what's been done at European level, where it's not a niche market, you know. And I mean, the European market has been in double digit growth for the last decade, and Ireland is starting to grow in parallel with that. And there is a demand for product that is produced in Ireland. I mean, our European neighbours want Irish organic products product. So absolutely, we need to move away from the niche. Um, consumers want organic food, they want Irish local organic produce and really I mean farmers have the ability to give that to them with some support and the Irish Organic Association welcomes the public support for the sector you know to enable it to grow because it does need support. It's at its infancy in Ireland um, but certainly when we look at the European model that's out there absolutely Ireland can be operating on that level of production because because Irish, Irish consumers want Irish organic products. Product. Yeah, and I mean, the over 2,000 farmers who joined the, the OFS, you know, in recent times, Grace, your organisation would have been dealing with a lot of queries, I would imagine, and questions on, on a one-to-one -one basis, because as Jack alluded to, everybody's farm is, is different, you know, just because I'm on this side of the ditch doesn't mean I'm the same as your farm. Yeah, absolutely, and I mean, that's what the certification bodies are there for, you know, our, for our inspectors are out on the ground every day, they're meeting organic farmers, and you know, we are there to help people as well on, on that process, because we want to see more farmers coming into the sector because we do believe that there's huge opportunities for farmers coming in. But absolutely, you know, I mean, if you have any queries about certification, as Jack said, pop down to the organic village. We're there and we're very happy to talk to farmers who are considering organic. But as you say, I mean, predominantly last year with, the, with farmers who came in was predominantly, you know, beef and sheep. But certainly there's opportunities in dairy and tillage and horticulture. And yeah, we'd love to see more farmers coming in and we're delighted to have kind of the the organic farming scheme open and on an annual basis. It's really welcomed by the sector. Yeah. Um, Kevin, I'm going to bring yourself in here because I suppose you've done it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're, you're, exactly. you're on the other side, as they say. So, I mean, just from a background point of view, just to explain to people your own background, because you're, you're a farm manager on a dairy farm in Wexford. You also have the home farm in, in Carlo. It's all organic now, I understand. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey and I suppose deciding to go organic and, 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 and how it works? For you. Uh, yeah, so the home farm is in South Carlo and um, the work farm is in near New Ross in Wexford, uh, the dairy farm. Um, I suppose the decision uh, back in 18 during the drought, uh, we looked at, we were spreading a lot of fertiliser and uh, to try and get grass to grow, it was, wasn't working. Um, so I went off looking at plants that were more drought resistant that time, uh, plantain and chicory and things like that, uh, multi species swarms effectively. Um, and I suppose my boss, Mary Biscal, had been on to me for a good while about organics. Uh, but we had to try and see, it was a dairy herd, 9,000 litre dairy herd. Um, so it was high input, high output. Um, so we had to um, see could we grow grass effectively without fertiliser? Uh, or what could we grow without fertiliser? Um, so yeah, we did that for from kind of 1920. Then we joined the organic scheme in 21 and were certified then last May. Uh, so it was a kind of a, we need a, nearly did a four year conversion instead of two. Yeah, and I suppose that kind of speaks to what Minister Hackett was saying a little while ago, especially in the, maybe the dairy sector as well, that there is maybe more of a run in needed than just the two years. There, there's adjustments are, are needed maybe outside of that time. Would you agree with that? Yeah, like we dropped back numbers. We were back to, we were at 180 cows, we're back to 155 this year. Uh, we have 181 in calf for next year. Um, grass is, we can't control grass at the moment, it's just getting ahead of us. Um, the, so yeah, we're going back up, like I know two, no two years are the same, but there's 500 tonnes of extra feeding in the pit that we actually won't need this winter. Um, so we'll, yeah, it's, you do need longer running, you have to, you have to try things, you have to try, like we went trying things ourselves and obviously went talking to the IOA, different things as well, um, but it's, it's more or less trial yokes yourself. Like, Cut back a bit on fertiliser, put in clover, put in multi-species, stuff like that. And yeah. as I said, we're going back up in numbers again next year. And a guesstimate, I suppose, like we were talking about fertiliser prices with our tillage panel just a few minutes ago. And, you know, how much do you estimate that you might have saved, I suppose, given uh, the fact that fertiliser prices now did get extraordinarily high, but like since you've converted? On a normal year, if we could say it that way, uh, mm -hmm. we were 46,000 a year on fertiliser. <clears throat> but that was on tillage crops as well. Um, so... 
yeah, that's a massive, massive save. And we just use our sorry more strategically now, and we use our um, our dung. Uh, we use a lot of bales. Uh, you can buy conventional straw, so it's the cheapest form of P and K to get in the gate um, in conventional straw. Uh, so the yeah, we're after saving about it was forty six thousand a year being spent on fertilizer. That was before the high prices last year or this year. Like we would have been up a hundred k last year on fertilizer alone. We would have been spending a hundred k. My gosh. So, and that puts it into, you know, stark figures there, doesn't it, you know, Jack? And I'm sure that it might not be as big a saving on maybe a smaller dry stock enterprise or something like that, but it, it is a significant saving, isn't it? That's huge. And I think what's important is that there's an awful lot of information that can flow between organic and farmers that are using fertilizer. Like, you don't have to be one or the other. Like, I mean, if you look at, say, the likes of clover and multi-species, like Kevin said, like every farmer in Ireland now is thinking about it. Organics is thriving on it and moving forward. Red clover, silage, you know, it's being supported by the department, by government. Mm -hmm. So is multi-species. And farmers are looking at it for themselves. So why can't you go organic would be the question I'd ask. One big thing every farmer should be doing is taking soil samples. If you don't have the pH, get the lime right. So the soil is going to release nitrogen naturally. So your pea is going to be more available. But all these things are happening anyway, whether you're organic or not. So for me, a lot of farmers should go home and see What's the situation with the sheds? Why am I organic? Like, what, what is stopping me becoming organic? Because to me, the floodgates are going to open. Like, I can't see there's a 50 billion market in Europe, 125 billion worldwide. We have a fantastic marketing agency in Bordbia. We just don't produce enough organic product to sell. Like, last year, we killed about 12,000 organic beef cattle. We need to be killing 20, 30, 40,000 more and get into a really strong position where we can market Ireland as an organic country across Europe mm -hmm. and around the world. And there's an opportunity there for Ireland to take, and we need to take it. Yeah, and, and Grace, I suppose the, the, the common misconceptions, the common myths, what would be a couple of them that you might like to dispel here? I mean, look, obviously there is certain requirements, and housing is something that we, we do kind of, you know, talk about very often when it comes to, to, to organic farming. What, what would be the ones that you, you commonly go, no, that's not the case? Well, I suppose, I mean, sometimes people are, are confused about the actual conversion period. Um, mm -hmm. So it is a two-year conversion period where you must farm organically, but you can't sell into the organic sector. Um, so that's probably the first misnomer or, or, you know, confusion area. But as you've outlined, Ashling, there is the organic farming, the organic food and farming standards in Ireland. So that's the regulations that farmers must abide to. But I suppose the most frequently asked questions would be from farmers who are considering organic would be, can I keep my own stock that I have on farm? Which obviously you can. Um, you can retain them for breeding purposes. Now, they won't gain organic status, but their offspring will if they're born three months um, after you go into organic conversion, their offspring will gain organic status when the land does. So that's probably one of the first things. Um, another issue would be around housing. If housing needs to be modified, which you do have to have 50% of the shed must be of solid construction um, with bedding and must be uh, available to, to livestock. So, and again, there's grants available under the Organic Capital Investment Scheme under TAMS 3 for farmers to actually convert their housing. Um, and also, I suppose one of the most other commonly asked questions would be about sourcing organic stock. Where do farmers source it? And we're delighted to say that there's more organic mar marts available around the country um, to facilitate stock. Um, obviously, two uh, farmers would buy from other organic farmers, um, and most farmers would breed their own replacements. Um, and then issues around sourcing organic seed. And we're delighted to say that in the last couple of years, more of the seed companies in Ireland are offering organic seed because we obviously farmers are obliged to try and use organic seed where available. Um, so they're probably the most common areas I think that farmers are concerned about. Yeah. And as Kevin alluded to earlier, I suppose one of the, the first questions farmers ask is, can you grow grass in an organic system? <laughs> um, and that is, you know, it's a genuine concern. So And he's growing quite a lot of us. <laughs> yes, Kevin has grown quite a lot. And, and you know, again, it's a bit slower in the springtime when you're an organic farmer, um, but once the soil temperatures warm up, you know, and clover kicks into action, you know, about eight degrees, you know, in the soil yeah. temperature, and then, you know, at the back end of the year, like this time of the year, you've got more than enough grass. So, but they would be, I suppose, the most, the, the questions that we get asked most frequently in the Irish Organic yeah. Association. Just today, <coughs> Minister Hackett launched the Organic Trading Hub. Yes. So, yeah. 
if you want to look at, say, source organic stock or seed or anything like Ray said, there's a one-stop shop there for organic farmers. It's funded by the department. It's really easy to use. And you can go in and see, because at the minute we do have a lot of people that are producing organic lamb and beef that don't end up on organic farms. And that's something that we want to deal with and we want to sort out. But like, uh, there are, it's real farming, so it's not magic or anything like that. You're still going to have problems, but it's an opportunity for people. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it should be looked at. And we have a huge number of farmers out there that can quite easily grow enough grass. It's just that we've become used to someone coming into the yard, telling us what to do. We need X amount of fertilizer. You need to use this spray and that spray. I remember my father telling me back in the 70s that someone came in to sell him chemical pesticides. And this was going to sort out all the weeds in Ireland in two within a year. Yeah. And look where we are 50 years later. It's not true. We've lost our understanding of the soil. We need to get it back. We need to understand what's happening, why a soil isn't producing grass. Is it compacted? What's the practice that you're doing? Why do multi-species grass change the actual colour of the soil and the health of it? That's what we need to be looking at, the soil, and actually using the soil to feed what we're growing, yeah. rather okay. than drawing in expensive inputs. Well, Jack, we're running tight on time. I suppose a bit of insider information from the department. When can we expect the organic farming scheme to open again? You should have asked Minister Hackett, I actually. did ask her, but I'll <laughs> ask you as well. Well, I'll go on what Minister Hackett said. It'll open later on in the year. That's all I can say. I'm sorry, but we would encourage everyone to come down to row 16 and walk around the organic village and talk to us all about it yeah. and find out for yourself whether it's real or not for you. And I'd imagine a series of farm walks will be advertised as well on yeah. the department website and I'm sure you'll have the details as well for us on Agriland. But that's where we're going to have to leave it. Kevin, thank you so much for telling us your story about conversion as well. Grace from the Irish Organic Association and of course Jack Nolan from the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. We're heading back out onto the site to see what is going on here in Rathaniska today.